It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing the man, the legend, Dr. Ira Lee Shapira, DDS, diplomat. I mean, he's got so many things. Diplomat, American Board, Dental Sleep Medicine, Diplomat, um, Alliance of uh, TMD Organization. I mean, it, it just goes on forever. I'll, I'll overrate him. He's uh, um, Diplomat American of Integrated Pain Management. Past Chair Alliance of TMD Organizations, Diplomat American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine, Diplomat American Board Sleep and Breathing, Regent Master and Fellow International College of Cranial Mandibular Orthopedics, Board Eligible American Academy of Craniofacial Pain, Professor Neuromuscular Orthodontics and Cranial Mandibular Orthopedics, University of Castellon. Uh, dental section editor, sleep and health journal, craniofacial pain section editor, uh, cr- uh, journal of craniomandibular sleep practice, member American Equilibration Society, member Academy of Applied Myofunctional Sciences, member Academy of Cosmetic Dentistry, life member ADA. I mean, and, and, and I mean, he has how many websites? Two, four, six, eight, ten websites. I mean, the man needs no introduction. I've known you on Dental Town uh, since two thousand four. Um, I mean, I've um, I, I I know so much about you, and and um, I, the reason I brought you on the show, and I'm honored that you came on, is um, um, the ADA. Uh, I'm sure you remember this post. Um, the ADA. Um, they came out with a new specialty. Where is that? Uh, uh, where is that link? And you wrote, uh, you, the, um, anyway, you posted a letter on Dental Town uh, when they did this uh, deal. And do you care if I read the letter? No, go for it. Okay, um, there it is right here. AAOP and ADA in unethical sneaky move in dentistry. That's, uh, that was a form. It was on, under Dental Town Ethics. He says in the ethics session, and this, uh, this thread just exploded. I mean, it was, uh. Um, everybody jumped on and piled on and uh, it says, um, he says, this is vitally important. Please read and comment. In the dark of the night and under cover of the COVID-19 pandemic, the American Dental Association has sanctioned a specialty in oral facial pain. The ADA has denied specialty for over 30 years. This is horrendous news for patients with TMJ disorders who respond to occlusal therapy. This is also a severe blow to dentists who treat sleep apnea, especially those who have obtained diplomat status with the American Board of Dental Sleep Medicine and the American Board of Sleep and Breathing. These dentists have far more knowledge and experience in the treatment of sleep apnea than do most members of the AOP. The ADA was previously sued by the American Academy of Head, Neck, and Facial Pain many years ago for going behind closed doors to change, create standards for treating TMJ um, disorders without comment. The ADA won the suit, and the court said that the ADA could hold a secret behind closed doors meeting, but they cannot implement that decision without open discussion. The spirit of that court battle and precedent still applies. The Academy of Oral Facial Pain and the ADA should not take advantage of the COVID-19 epidemic to sneak in changes that will forever adversely affect headache, migraine, and TMD patients and the membership of the ADA. I suggest every TMJ patient, every dentist let the ADA know that open discussions in public should be held. I have been told in the past by the current president of the AOP that specialty designation is all about money and being able to change more and receive more from insurance companies and that it won't affect practice standards. Um, and that was written to Catherine Bauman, Director, National Commissions on Recognition of Dental Specialties and Certifying Boards. Um, I mean, I could go on and read uh, the whole letter to her too. Uh, but I, when I saw that, I thought, oh my God, I'm dentistry uncensored. You can you could uh, say whatever you want. So that obviously, I mean, I, I could see your face having pain when you when you wrote that. Why did this bother you so bad? Why why did this hit you so hard? Okay, so a few things. I, I've been doing neuromuscular dentistry for since 1980, and we've lived through other episodes like this in the past. So in 1988, as you mentioned. The ADA tried to go through behind closed doors and say everything we did is wrong, but they didn't actually have the knowledge for it. Later on, the same, a lot of the same group of people went through the FDA and they tried to get rid of neuromuscular dentistry by having the FDA say, oh my God, this stuff is dangerous. And a lot of the people who are well known in the oral facial pain committee actually ended up being subpoenaed by congressional committees The FDA threw away all their discussions they had, and basically a lot of these people are never allowed to testify at the ADA again, and a cash settlement was made to the company of Myotronics, 
for malfeasance on the part of the FDA panel. So things happen over and over again. Personally to me, many years ago, I treated a patient. He'd been in pain for 15 years. I got him out of pain and gave him back his life. And in the middle of this, he had a motor vehicle accident and got rear-ended. And all of a sudden, he ended up in an oral facial pain office. And he actually, I ended up in the middle of a lawsuit and I had Dr. Charlie Green on the other end of it. And you find yourself in a position you never meant to get into. And sometimes people tell lies, but what happened to me during the course of this is Dr. Green wrote a letter saying, this is the worst treatment he's ever seen in his whole life. And he said that, sent it to the insurance company after thoroughly reviewing all the records of, the, of Dr. Shapira. And he put this letter on Northwestern University stationery. And he said, boy, you messed up. Problem was, there was a cover letter on that. And it said, I hope this gets the results you want. And the whole thing was dated prior to him ever receiving the records. So he made up his mind and decided to go for it. These are things have been happening over and over again, and it gets your dander up. So as you said, I wrote a letter to Ms. Bauman. Actually, I wrote about 30 or 40 emails to Ms. Bauman, and I was talking about what's going on with the consult to approve a, a specialty in oral facial pain, because it was approved. Well, actually it wasn't approved. Actually, the ADA council that was meant to approve it denied it. It did just what it's always done for the last 30 years. It denied the thing, except this time there was a special deal under the table. We don't really know exactly what it is because all the ADA members on the panel are sworn to secrecy by the ADA bureaucracy. Now, I know swearing to secrecy is in nowadays with Trump around, but you know, the ADA is supposed to be representing the dentists and taking care of the best interests of the dentists and the patients. So, but that's okay because there was an appeal process. And on the appeal process, they appointed a whole bunch of people to be the appealing things, except all the people on the appeal are unnamed. Ms. Bauman refused to name them. So there was an appeal meeting that overturned the council that had denied it after hearing the evidence. And there's no minutes, or if there are minutes, they've never been released. And we've asked over and over again to see them released. So you say, why do I get upset? Well, I'm old. I'm 70 years old. I'm not going to practice that much longer, but I care about my profession. And when people start kicking the legs out from under it, it's a problem. And I don't know if we even need an oral facial pain specialty because we have medical specialties like neurology and neurosurgeons, and all of them do exactly what the oral facial pain wants to do is treat these problems with medicine sometimes with psychology, sometimes with psychiatry, but they don't do anything different than their medical colleagues who treat oral facial pain and headaches and migraines and trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. What's their training? They're trained as dentists. Why is there an oral facial pain specialty? Ah, because the teeth and the jaw muscles and the joints are involved. Now, there are some excellent oral facial pain doctors. I have a lot of friends who are oral facial pain doctors, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't learn the science and you shouldn't be able to use the medications, but exactly how does that make it medicine versus dentistry? So I think as dentists, and you can stop me if you want to put something no, in. No, no, I'm not going to gonna interrupt the platform. man. Go ahead. I think as dentists, we, we have a crazy important role and the teeth are a super important part of it. So the trigeminal nerve, we all know what it is. It's our nerve. It comes right out of the brain, which means all the nerves that we deal with that go to the teeth and the muscles and the joints, they're not like peripheral nerves that go to your arms and your legs. They're brain cells. You take out somebody's tooth, you kill some brain cells. So we have three divisions to that trigeminal nerve. And it's like, and they're built for feedback. 
But if you look at all the input from the trigeminal nerve, and then when it enters the brain, it gets it gets multiplied, it, it gets amplified like an old Macintosh amplifier as it heads up into the brain. And after it's been amplified, it accounts for more than half the total input to the brain. And that's, we're the masters. We're in charge of it. We can mess it up. But the oral facial pain people say, boy, you should never adjust occlusion to treat a TMJ problem or a chronic pain problem. So I just have a simple question for all your listeners. Have you ever put a filling or a crown in with a high spot? And then the next day, the tooth hurt, and a week later, they had head and jaw pain. Well, according to the AOP, you shouldn't ever adjust the bite to treat the pain problem because it's not the cause. This is a neuropsychiatric disease. This is, has to do with the HPA access, the hypothalamus, the pituitary, the adrenals. And I absolutely agree, but there's nobody better to treat a lot of this than you and me. So I think you ever treat a TMJ patient, Howard? No, not me. There's no crazy people in Phoenix. Um, I, I, I'm going to I'm going to keep going through your letter because I um these I mean we're dentistry uncensored and and I think everything you're talking about today it would not get published uh, in most places. Um, it says, dear Miss Kathy Bauman, um, ADA committee for the recognition of dental specialties and certified boards. Um, blah 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 blah. blah. Um, num- number one, not needed. Um, especially in oral facial pain, it's not needed. Many general practice dentists by education experience currently are able to recognize causes of oral facial pain and successfully remediate them through treatment modalities within the scope of their general practice. Number two, anti-competitive. The, an- the Academy's request for recognition is anti-competitive for many reasons, if granted, will harm the public and GPs, many of whom are ADA members. Price, creating the specialty will eliminate the right of currently well-qualified GPs to provide care within the scope of their experience without obtaining unnecessary specialty approval or supervision by the academy. Uh, recognition will be in the long run exclude GPs as competitors of academy members. Um, prejudicial exclusion. The academy avowedly opposes occlusion-based treatment modalities of OP despite their indisputable basis in science and demonstrated efficacy through GPs, allowing the academy as manager of the proposed specialty set standards, which exclude occlusion-based remediation as one more way of limiting competition and patient access to relief currently provided. Uh, subject power grab, the academy and its members have not demonstrated knowledge and skill in the treatment of sleep apnea, field of practice, which has enjoyed strong growth in recent years. Um, coerced educational fees, and then this is interesting, lack of grandfather status. Notably, the Academy does not propose to confer grandfathered status to those GPs who are already fully qualified by training and practice to relief OP in appropriate cases. Each of these anti-competitive designs and effects will undoubtedly draw the attention of federal and state antitrust enforcement of bodies. More litigation is the last thing the ADA should wish. Um, Lack of grandfather status. A lot of these kids don't realize that the big endodontists of our day when we were little, like like um, um, the McSpadden condenser out of Chattanooga, Tennessee. Well, they didn't go to endo programs. They had practice limited to endo. And um, if you just decide all you want to do is endo, you just stop doing everything else because all your friends aren't going to send you the root canal if you're going to do the crown and get them back for the cleaning and all that stuff. So they realize that um, what specially meant is um, it needs to be um, only that procedure to make the referring physicians and dentists feel safe to refer that you're not going to steal the whole family and the patient, all that kind of stuff. Um, but when they did come out with like endodontics, they grandfathered in all the people who said they were practice limited to endo. Do you think if they would have done that specifically with you, who's got all these diplomats and I mean, my God, you got 10 different websites. You got more initials behind your name than the Greek and American and Latin uh, alphabet combined. Do you think if they would have reached out to you and grandfather you in, um, this would have sat better with you and you wouldn't have wrote this letter? No, I probably still, I didn't actually write the, write the letter because I want diplomat status. Like I said, I'm old. I've had my professional life. If I want to retire tomorrow, I can. The reason I still treat patients is it makes me happy. When I can get somebody in and change their life, it's amazing. I posted two videos today from two patients I saw. One of them had horrible anxiety and panic attacks. 
it's like when you can take somebody like that in a matter of a few minutes, take it away by working with the trigeminal nerve and the autonomic nervous system, it's huge. Why would I want to lose the ability and for young guys to lose the ability to do this? The innovations in dentistry, dental sleep medicine didn't come from the oral facial pain guys. Dental facial pain, dental sleep medicine came from people who had a family member or had a sleep problem and looked for ways to fix it. The very first dental sleep appliance was the equalizer by a guy named Larry Glaze, who was a lab neuromuscular lab tech. Jim Gary did one of the very first modified Herbst appliances. Uh, did you know Jim? Um, I'm, what is his name again? Jim Gary. He actually first Jim Gary. The, Jim Gary. He first turned the coin oral myofunctional therapy. He developed the nook not as a pacifier, but as an exerciser to help kids' jaws grow properly. So the problem with experts is now you have an authority, and authority knows better than everybody, and you tend to lose things. And you lose the innovation of the systems. So I always do neuromuscular, but I belong to the American Equilibration Society. This is a group of people who treat the same problems I do, but they use a different methodology, a different starting point. And you know, if you go through them, an awful lot of them have very good success. Because even though we have different methods, all of us are trying to do one thing. We're trying to create a healthy patient. And it's like, when you define a healthy patient, I define a healthy patient that when they, as far as their jaw, jaw function, that they function comfortably, they don't have headaches and migraines, and when they close their mouth from a relaxed position and they use their teeth, it goes back to a relaxed position. That's my definition of neuromuscular dentistry, but it connects to lots of other stuff. So when you take somebody in authority and they say, well, I don't like that, and that's what happened with a lot of members of the AOP when they tried to do some slimy things and destroy something they didn't like. They didn't like the ability to measure. That's what neuromuscular dentistry, dentists do. They measure. They measure physiology. They measure position and movement. We can see where a click happens. We can measure the frequency of the sounds it makes. But you know, all that measurements gave facts. And those facts didn't ac agree with some people's opinions. So. You can't have your opinion be proved wrong by facts. So sometimes the best thing to do is destroy the ability of people to measure these items and create, show these facts. So authority bothers me. I mentioned before I was with, uh, in a lawsuit, I did win it, um, but Dr. Green was the expert witness against me. And in his, in his talk, he mentioned lots of different things, but the attorney actually asked them, who's the expert? And everything he said that I did was wrong. And then he said, well, I think the Academy of Oral Facial Pain, those are the experts. So then I helped the attorney a lot with this. We pulled out what the Academy of Oral Facial Pain had in their treatment mythology, orthologies, and Dr. Green, and we had mentioned them one after another. And Dr. Green says, I don't agree with that. And I don't agree with this. And then finally he says, well, who do, who do you think is expert? And he says, well, I'm the expert. I trust my opinions but not necessarily anybody else's op opinions. Well, that's fine. And then he says, but I don't treat TMJ patients. I choose not to. So now you have somebody who's going to decide what the right way to treat them is, but he chooses not to. So I choose to treat people by correcting structural problems that put no susceptive input into the brain. That's it. And by doing so, I change neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. Many of them choose to give people drugs to change neurotransmitters in the central nervous system. I think there's a place for that. And I think the neurologists and the psychiatrists are the ones who are best at it. And the ones who really understand it better than anybody is probably the pharmacists. That is, I was not seeing that coming. Why do you say the pharmacist? Ah, because they really study the medications and their effects and their side effects. 
So long before I was a dentist, I was a microbiologist at Ohio State. And I still remember looking at drugs and they had a study on the very first cholesterol drug and it was gonna stop people from making cholesterol. Then we wouldn't have any cholesterol problems. Well, it turns out it stopped people from making cholesterol just a step or two before it became cholesterol. And it turns out the products that accumulated in the body were a whole lot worse than cholesterol and it would kill people faster than arthrosclerosis ever would. So every time we have a drug, we have a side effect. I understand that they wanna use drugs to treat these problems. It's easy. The problem is read the list of side effects, read the problems. It's like if you can treat a patient without introducing lots of drugs and give them back their life, why give them a toxic minefield of drugs that may or may not help? Most of the patients that come into my office and most of the members of ICMO, ICMO is the neuromuscular scientific group, all of us have, we, we have people who come in with a list of 10, 20, 30 drugs they've been in before they got into our offices. Well, why did they come to us? Because they've been through the medical route and it didn't work. Well, now if we send them to an oral facial pain person, instead of having a neurologist, psychiatrist, neuropsych guy giving them the prescriptions, we're going to have a dentist giving them the prescriptions. I'm not sure that's how I want things done. And it doesn't mean I don't like these people. There's very smart people. I listened to Jeff Okuson. The guy's brilliant. But, you know, at a meeting recently with him, about a year ago, he's doing sphenopalatine blocks. Are you familiar with those? Yes. I love sphenopalatine blocks. They've been around for over 100 years. They're one of the safest things in all of medicine. And Jeff Okuson uses them at the TMD program he's in. And the residents go and do sphenopalatine ganglion blocks using an instrument called the sphenocath. And every time the patient has pain, they can come in and have a sphenopalatine ganglion block. I've been teaching for the last 35 years patients how to self-administer sphenopalatine ganglion blocks with cotton tip catheters that are sterile. It's real easy. I, I, you know, I love that video on your website, but I don't want to interrupt you, but you have so many websites. Um, you have um, thinkbetterlife.com, northshoresleepdentist.com, I hate CPAP.com, Delaney Dental Care, uh, TMD Alliance Org, ICMO, um, International College of um, Orthopedics. Um, you have so many websites, but when you're talking about that, you put up those two videos. Which one should they, which website should they see those videos? Uh, that you have to go to my YouTube channel for. So my YouTube channel, the easiest way to find it is just to Google Think Better Life YouTube. I've got about 200, uh, I got over 200 videos there. Yeah, his, so his um, website is um, um, his YouTube. I have it right here. Where is it? Um, did, did you know you can, um, okay, I'll, so I'll go to Think Better Life on YouTube. Think Better Life. Where, where'd you get that name at? How, how uh, I was my web guy. He said, we need a good name. What do you do? I said, I give people a better life. So he says, good, we want people who are thinking about having a better life. So those two videos that you uploaded today, are those on your YouTube channel? They're the first two on my YouTube channel right now. Um, both of them only- Oh, two hours ago, one's, one's the uh, DNA appliance. Okay, so that, see the girl. Okay, so continue, go ahead, go on. Okay, Sorry. the first one with the DNA appliance, she was a terrible TMJ patient. She had five years of severe disabling and pain that didn't allow her to live her life. She had to quit her job and move back home with her parents. It destroyed her life. She'd been to tons of medical specialists. We put her in a neuromuscular appliance. She got better. The first video was three years ago. She did a video talking about living with five years of severe pain. And then this was the second video because she's been up in Canada for a long time and she moved back. And so she, we put her in a DNA appliance, epigenetic orthopedics, we grew her a bigger airway and we cured her sleep apnea. Now, ideally, in a more civilized society, we wouldn't have all these people with sleep apnea because if we had proper oral facial development, we can grow kids out of it. And when we grow them out of sleep apnea, we grow them out of ADD, we grow them out of ADHD, 
These kids all, an awful lot of these kids have adenoid facies. They don't look right. They have these allergic faces and you can recognize them. I talked about Jim Gary before. In 1967, a book was published, A Stigmata of Respiratory Disorders. Jim so Gary. So it must be Catholic then, right? No, but my son-in-law started out studying to be a Catholic priest. Because I thought the stigmata wasn't that the, isn't that the a Catholic stigmata, thing? Yeah, yeah the hands was, were, these, were there. Well, these are the signs of people who are suffocating when they're growing up in kids. And we've been ignoring them. So are you familiar with Dr. Corey Cheney? Uh, Corey Cheney. Uh, was he with, um, was he with um, um, James Gary? What's no, his guy's he, name? He, he's the next generation. At the same time as Jim Gary, Jim Gary was a neuromuscular dentist, Pete Adonis, who was treating, teaching us that we have to grow healthier kids and healthier, sculpt, healthier airways. He was neuromuscular. If you went to the centric relation side of the world, Brian Palmer, who's just a prince of a man, was doing the same thing. But so James F. They Gary, doing that. James F. Gary DDS out in Fullerton, California, was a pediatric yes. dentist, neuromuscular pediatric dentist? Yes. Damn. Huh. That is, uh, uh, I, I, I didn't realize he was a pediatric dentist, but anyway, uh, yeah. but sorry to interrupt. Keep going. And forever, I owe him a debt of gratitude because what he taught me in the early 80s is what allowed me to recognize when my son was between three and four years old that he had airway problems and sleep problems. At five years old, my son was told he could not stop start kindergarten because he had ADD, ADHD. They wanted to put him on a Ritalin for the rest of his life. You know, when your kid can't start kindergarten, you worry what's going to happen to him. I was talking to Jim Gary. I kept talking to the doctors. The pediatrician says it's not a problem. ENT says it's not a problem. You know, if it's your kid, it's a problem. I took my kid to Rush Medical School. Dr. Cartwright, Rosalind Cartwright was there. I just got very lucky because she's the mother of all of dental sleep medicine. She brought my son in. She did a sleep test. Turned out he had an apnea index of 60. He quit breathing once a minute all night long. We took out his tonsils and an adenoids. We widened his mouth orthopedically. And this kid who couldn't go to school without Ritalin became a straight A student and graduated college, double major, double minor, magna cum laude. Drug of choice, oxygen. The American Dental Association now recognizes this. My son just needed to breathe at night. The American Dental Association has been having programs on pediatric airways. Kudos to the American Dental Association but it hasn't been accepted by the American College of Orthodontists. So Robert Coricini wrote a book, What Anthropology Teaches Us About ortho, ortho, Orthodontic Diagnosis. And what he showed in his studies was that for the last 400 years, people are growing smaller jaws and smaller airways. We are growing unhealthy children. We are turning evolution backwards. So epigenetic orthodontics is what we call the DNA appliance because we correct the phenome. The phenome, we correct how people grow. When they take out four teeth on a child and they do suck back orthodontics and they crowd the tongue, the child has to make all sorts of compensations. Just recently, just in the last month or two, uh, if you Googled shrinking jaws in Stanford, there's a huge article about how humans are getting shrinking jaws and smaller airways. All of these things lead to lifetime, lifetime problems of pasture, of memory, of thought, how we function. It can lead to lipid problems in our bloodstream. It can lead to insulin resistance problems. As you get sleep apnea, it can lead to heart attacks and strokes. This is important stuff, and it's you need the innovators to do this. The experts just want to follow the protocols. Somebody had to come up with the information to make the protocols. You know, I just saw another article. Um, you know, we'll go to another, especially um, the uh, oral surgeons. There was a, you know, they made the New York Times. Where was that article on? Um, oh yeah, new uh, Mu Orthodontists get a New York Times article. How two British orthodontists became celebrities and. Uh, and it's just a huge threat on Dentaltown. But I always, I always think what's most interesting is um, 
I, you know, I podcast every 50 orthodontists on this show. And I just point blank, I'm like myofunctional therapy. I said, dude, is there anything you agree with that or any? Nope. And I'm just like, wow. I mean, just dead. It's just like, next question. It's like, really? You can just throw that whole thing under a bridge like that? And they go, yeah. And, and on this one, um, when I posted that, I actually got personal emails from three orthodontists saying, Howard, why do you post that shit on your, you know what I mean? And, and number one, let me, let me answer that. Like, like, I'll give you another example. Like, um, um, when it's some bad, like a dentist gets arrested, uh, say, say it's arrested for opium or a hidden camera in the bathroom or whatever. Um, you need to post that because when I posted that one about the Canadian who hit a camera in his bathroom and was filming his staff in the bathroom, and all these people are downtown, like, oh my God, you're ruining our reputation. And why do you post that stuff? And I said, because I believe that. Some people have brain health issues, and I think sociopaths don't know they're sociopaths, but maybe a sociopath who's a dentist who sees that might analytically think, wow, I should not do that. Maybe he'll quit doing it for all their own reasons. It wasn't even six months, and another dentist in the States was arrested for that. So I put all this up there. Furthermore, your patients are reading this stuff about um, these two British orthodontists. I mean, hell, it made the New York Times. So you're telling me, that a story in the New York Times about orthodontics that I'm the bad guy for posting it. I mean, how dumb can you be? Uh, but anyway, um, but I've noticed this the whole time. Um, um, some call it turf wars, but did you see that the the new orthodontic article in the New York Times? And is that kind of the same thing that you're talking about? Okay, so I did see the Mew article, and the problem with mewing is it's too little, too late. And Doctor Professor Mew and Doctor Mew both in England. In England, guess who rules all the specialties? It's the orthodontists. Well, the orthodontists didn't believe in two-stage orthodontics. So they decided to get together and rule on whether or not this was good or bad. And they said, well, we think it's bad because we don't do it. Because if we, and if we don't do it and it's good, then we're not doing it right. Now, in this country, we've been putting people in expansion appliances forever and ever. And there's all different types. So I use a DNA appliance. A long time ago, I did a Crozats. But there's Schwartz appliance. There's Bionators. And they all work. So how do people grow? How does orthodontic work? Orthodontic works. You put pressure on a tooth. And that puts pressure on the bone. Where the pressure, where the bone is under pressure, it shrinks away and you get osteoclastic action. But on the other side of the tooth, you have little periosteal ligaments that pull on the bone. And so it causes the bone on the other side of the socket to grow. Well, this is important stuff because that's why we can move teeth through bone. Ah, but you can also move it too far through the bone. So you can get too much of a good thing. And that can happen. As the chair of the TMD Alliance, I wrote letters and got other people to write letters to stand up for Dr. Mew. In our country, in, in LA, we have Dr. Hang, who's growing people bigger airways. In Chicago, Illinois, we have Dr. Kevin Boyd. He grows healthier children. How does he, he's not an orthodontist, but he uses orthopedics, and he does it starting at a very young age. I'm thrilled he's there, because if he wasn't there, I'd be morally obligated to treat little kids. And I don't want to treat little kids. I'm too old for that. When they come into my office, I make them balloon animals. But Kevin Boyd, he's changing the world. If you go to Lori's Children's Hospital, connected to Northwestern University, they send all the kids with problems to him. If you catch these kids early, you can change their lives. And the sleep expert at University of Chicago, Dr. Gazal, he says, if you haven't grown these kids bigger bigger by the time they're seven years old, it's too late. When I was young, younger, I used to think I was brilliant because I got my son in to have his sleep apnea treated at five. I thought that was the greatest thing in the world. But right now I know I was two years too late because those first five years of life is when we get the most brain growth. How can we say we're going to wait till kids are 12 or 13 or 14 year old, year old to work on making their airway better? How soon, how long do you want to go, Howard, without being able to breathe? The rule of threes, you can only go three minutes without breathing, three days without water, three weeks without food. That seems a little extreme. I don't think the rule of threes is working here. 
I think it's six minutes without oxygen, but an interesting thing, because I have a friend who actually developed their brain resuscitation machine. And when you go without oxygen, the problem isn't that you're going without oxygen, that does not kill your brain. What happens instead is when you reoxygenate the brain, you've built up lots of free radicals from the time you were without oxygen. Now, when you add oxygen, which is very reactive, the oxygen combines with the free radicals that makes more free radicals, which combines with free radicals, and you get an oxidative stress disaster. That's what destroys the brain. There's a company called Organ Inc. that actually pass, pulls off organs for donation, and they pump antioxidants through them to keep them alive. And some of the early studies, they were able to take dead organs and transplant them with almost perfect success even though they didn't meet transplant protocols. These are the things that are happening that are important. There are so many things out there. How soon is soon enough to treat a problem that can affect you for the rest of your life? And it can be a cosmetic problem. So the, I talked about the adenoid facies. If you went to University of Michigan, and you go to McNamara's book, he wrote a book, oh, probably 25 or 30 years ago, talking about nasorespiratory function. Being able to breathe through your nose doesn't seem all that important, but the kids who can't do it don't look right. They have adenoid facies. They have dark circles under their eyes. They usually have forward head postures. He cited a study in that book where they put genius level kids with adenoid facies and they put them in classrooms with kids with pretty little faces and average IQs. And then the teachers who didn't know this had happened had these kids in their classes and they called the ones with the pretty symmetrical faces, smart, helpful, intelligent. And the genius level kids who had adenoid faces were dull problem kids, dull witted and all the negative adjectives. And then these kids are in school and they respond to the teachers how the teachers respond to them. And we start wrecking their lives at a very young age. A good friend of mine is a Dr. Alex Goldman. He started his life in Russia as a pediatric cardiologist. By the time he left Russia, he was in charge of sleep for about a third of Russia. When he came to this country, he ended up at the University of Chicago, the same time Bill DeMent was there and Raz Cartwright were there. That was the birth of sleep medicine in this country. Well, I used to teach at his school, his techs, he, he had the only school in Illinois to teach sleep techs. So I used to teach him how to adjust oral appliances during a polysonography. Well, one day I showed up early before my lecture was due and I'm watching the previous lecture he's showing. And he has all these kids that look like my adenoid facies allergy kids. And he keeps calling them FLKs. And he says how these kids are going to more and more end up in prison and they'll end up as dropouts and all these horrible things are going to happen in their lives. And he keeps calling them FLKs. And I, I just had to ask him, what's an FLK? And he goes, funny looking kids. They don't look right. Now, aside from being a sleep doctor and a neurologist and a psychiatrist, he was also the head of child psych at Cook County for 25 years. That's the hospital in the movie ER. The man's brilliant. He writes lectures on everything. He wrote the first book on sleep psychiatry. It's like he writes poems and novels and scientific articles on sleep and cancer. But how would you like it if your grandson was one of the kids that he called an FLK and said, hell, this kid's probably going to have a bad life for the next 50 years. And it, it, it's so true because the number one goal of a species is to survive long enough to reproduce and have offspring. And you got to look as pretty as a peacock. And if something is wrong with your face, uh, you know, um, you know, it makes life more challenging. And it's obviously life's a lot easier if you're uh, handsome, right? Yeah, hair helps too, but we seem to have failed that. <laughs> do, you, do you know why um, I can uh, prove to you that I'm not two-faced? Why? If I was two-faced, would I be showing you this one? Oh, good point. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, beauty is um, very, very important. Um, you've said so many things. I didn't want to interrupt you because you're, uh, um, you're I mean, just amazing, um, all you've done and all your qualifications. But i I'm uh, got to speak for the, the kids here. So one-fourth of the people listening us, to us today are still in dental kindergarten school. And really, um, you, you said you were old twice. 
Um, I'll go on the record and say I'm actually dead. Uh, but these kids, they get confused. The first thing they get confused with TMJ is some of you older guys call it neuromuscular and some of you guys uh, call it CR, pinky, whatever. Um, and that is a confusing thing. They don't want to sign up for uh, this course if they think, well, is that the right one? So why are there two? I mean, is there two types of ortho or endo? I mean, if you want to learn how to do a root canal, they don't say, well, are you an apical barbarian like Howard who wants to seal her out the apex? Or are you one of them pulp lovers like Ira who just wants to get a half millimeter from the end? You know what I mean? So why this fork at the road, and how would you answer that question? Okay, so... I'd be happy to talk. I did actually give at the American Equilibration Society. I wrote an article on neuromuscular dentistry and how I defined it. And when I wrote that article, it was specifically designed for CR doctors to read it. But the first thing we have to understand about the jaw, it's a three-legged stool. Have you ever sat on a three-legged stool, Howard? Yes. Okay. (laughs) All three legs are the same length. It works pretty good, right? What if one or two of the legs are slightly different lengths? Does that rack bother you a little bit? It kind of makes you crazy. So if you go sit on it for five minutes, it's no big deal. But now you're at a bar with friends and you're sitting on this three-legged stool that racks. And it's like, if you had a pack of matches, you'd put it under the leg to steady it, but nobody carries matches anymore. So instead you put one arm on the bar and you put a leg and stretch it out and you figure out a way to stabilize yourself. And then you sit there imbibing for two hours. At the end of two hours, you hurt all over your body. That's kind of how the jaw works. We have two jaw joints and we have teeth. And if everything closes perfectly, all the muscles work the way they're supposed to. We close, we don't overstress our muscles, and then we relax. If it doesn't happen that way, what do we get? Well, we use our muscles to protect the whole. So if you're gonna give it a name, I would call it muscular dentistry. Because if you use your muscles to protect the whole, that's what's important. That's what muscles do all over the body is they protect us. And if we use them right, they do a great job. The problem is we use them wrong. Do you know what a repetitive strain injury is? Carpal tunnel, rotator cuff, tennis elbow. If we use our muscles wrong, they start to hurt. According to Janet Travell, they start to get myofascial pain and dysfunction. They get shortened taut bands and trigger points that can cause referred pain. Now, if you have a, a trigger point in your trapezius on your right side and you tip your head to the left, it hurts, but it, and it could give you a headache. But if you tip it to the right, it feels better. So now you start to walk around with its head tipped to the side. Well, now that's like putting that three-legged stool on a floor that's tipped. It doesn't work so good anymore, even if the legs are the same length. Uh, do you know what an aqualizer is? I think they sometimes are, you sponsor them sometimes on dental town. An aqualizer? An aqualizer. Okay, so Marty Lerman, he's, he's dead now. He was a smart guy. He, de- he, envel- he decided that we're going about dentistry all wrong. And he developed an appliance that he called an aqualizer. It's a hydraulic appliance. It works on Pascal's third law of hydraulics. What does that mean? So hydraulics, if you put fluid in a closed chamber... Wherever you measure the pressure, it's equal. So he made a little appliance that goes over the back teeth on one side of the mouth and the back teeth on the other side of the mouth. And when you bite your teeth together, the pressure is always equalized the right side to the left, instantly. It's even. You can look in somebody's mouth and see what's wrong. But funny thing about laws of physics and science, it doesn't change. It's the laws are there. We call them physics, but they're, they're, they're physical laws that are unchangeable. Now, all of a sudden, you can see what happens. I'm doing a research problem with some, uh, with some physical therapists right now. But if I take an aqualizer appliance and I put it in a patient's mouth who has a long leg, short leg syndrome. So they have a tip to their hips when they stand. And we put that aqualizer appliance in their mouth and I have them go up and down a flight of steps or walk around for several minutes. And then they come back. I can check the leg length on them. And you know, the majority of them, the leg length is now equal. Well, the question is if they had a long leg, short leg and they walk around and they're now equal, did somebody cut an inch off one leg or did the other leg grow? Well, truth is that's not what it is. 
what happened is we changed the curves in the thoracal lumbar spine. And when we did that, and how did we do it? We did it because we balanced the mouth. We took away the compensations that go from the head down to the toes. And as we did that, the muscles relaxed. Well, when you have curvatures that are wrong in the thoracal lumbar spine, that's sometimes called things like scoliosis, but you can have a functional scoliosis. And now if you have three, and you can go to Trebell's book on myofascial pain and dysfunction, she has a fabulous picture of it. But if you go and you look where the taut bands are, they're always on the inside of the curve and you get trigger points there. And then you get back pain and it can be upper or middle or lower back pain. Now, if you're gonna make a TMJ appliance for a patient and their whole body's out of whack and now you put an appliance where you do a crown in their mouth and now they change positions, you don't have the same patient. So do you know who Sherrington is? Sherrington? Sherrington. Okay, so Lord Sherrington, he got a a Nobel Prize for work on what was called the writing reflex. So I'm going to give a special thank you to Dr. Norman Thomas, and you'll send me a link and I'll send this to him because he's been pounding neurology into my head and anatomy into my head for the last 40 years, except I'm kind of a sieve, so I can't remember nearly enough of it. What Sherrington did, and this will never be repeated in humans because it's hard to find volunteers. But he did tests. And so if somebody was to poke you right here with a pin and you were standing, what would happen is your head would pull one way and you'd fall over like a tree because you were out of balance. But that doesn't happen. Actually, what happens instead, our head goes one way, our shoulder goes the other, our hip goes the other, and we don't fall. So it's called the writing reflex. Now, a reflex, kind of like the patella reflex when they hit your knee and your foot kicks, it doesn't go to the brain. So in order to do his research, Sherrington used decerebrate cats. What does that mean? Ah, he disconnected the brain. That's why it's really hard to find people to volunteer for this project, because most of us like our brains firmly attached to our spinal column. But that reflex exists, and it exists in all of us. And it's like, we can manipulate it, but if we don't manipulate it, Our body, that reflex is there to protect us. So the most common place we see that reflex is when we look at new babies who are just learning to stand and walk. And you look at a little kid and he's trying to stand and walk and he falls over. Or he tries to take a step and he falls over. And we think, well, he's just not smart enough to learn to walk yet. But the truth is it has nothing to do with the brain because the writing reflex is a peripheral reflex And what happens is his nerves aren't myelinated enough. The nerve impulses don't pass fast enough that it's intact. So we have lots of reflexes. When you put this on the podcast, I'm going to tell you, put this out. There's a guy named A.J. Miller. I think he's at Stanford or UCLA. And he wrote a paper, Oral and Pharyngeal Reflexes, or Oral and Pharyngeal Reflexes, Tongue Reflexes. So we have all these crazy reflexes in our body, and they're important. Some of them are simple. Some of them are complex. So when we're a newborn baby, we have something called the tip of the tongue reflex. It's important for development. First time mom sticks her breasts in a baby's mouth, the tongue touches the nipple, and it immediately protrudes forward. And when it does that, it pushes the nipple against the roof of the mouth, and the baby gets rewarded with milk. Baby's happy. He does it again. And nursing is a learned behavior. But in order order to learn the behavior, you have a basic reflex that's there. 50 years later, you chip a tooth. That tip of the tongue reflex is still there. And now you touch the tongue, tip of your tongue to the chipped tooth. And by the time you get to the the dentist, your tongue's a bloody mess because you've been playing with it 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It's a hard reflex. You say, don't do that. They can't stop it. We have another reflex, which has to do with the lateral surfaces of the tongue. You touch the lateral surface of the tongue, it's a retrusive reflex. The tongue goes back into the pharynx. You ever have, it occludes the airway. You ever have to fight like the devil to work on a lower tooth on somebody? Because the tongue is just out of control. They're trying to protect their airway. They're telling us, I got an airway problem. Don't mess it up any more than it already is. We know 40% of the men, by the time they're age 
40 are going to be having sleep apnea, snoring, upper airway resistance syndrome. Diseases like fibromyalgia that women get are related to upper airway resistance syndrome. A guy named Moldovsky years ago started to disturb people's sleep to see what would happen. He took healthy young college students, and every time they got into deep delta sleep, he'd wake them up. He'd disturb their sleep. And what happened is they all developed fibromyalgia or fibromyalgia-like syndromes. And he said, isn't that an interesting thing? And then he quit waking them up. But when he quit waking them up, the symptoms didn't go away. In fact, these patients had developed something, a pattern of sleep called alpha intrusion into delta sleep. In their deep delta sleep, they'd have wide awake brain waves, and then they had pain. Well, funny thing, when women get pregnant, first time they're pregnant, even if they don't carry the baby to term, their brain changes. When, when babies are in the house, mom's the one who hears them cry, not dad. So what happens, even when mom's in deep sleep, her brain has alpha waves in her deep sleep. That's so she can hear the baby cry, because if you counted on dad, he'd never hear the baby cry. You may have a great dad. He may warm a bottle or bring the baby in for mom to nurse, but he doesn't hear the baby cry. The only reason he knows the baby's crying is because he got an elbow on his side. Wake up. Get the baby. It's like, so all of these things are reflexes, and they live with us forever. So you, Howard, me, we all have genomes. Those are our genes, our DNA, our hardwired hardware. That's what our genes are made of. And then we have something called a phenome. So you can have identical twins, and one gets fat, and one stays skinny. They still have identical genomes, but they don't have the same appearance. And those are the epigenetic changes. When we talk about shrinking jaws, when we talk about Coricini, when I talk about Dr. Hang in California and Dr. Boyd in Chicago, these are people who recognize this and they say, why do we wanna let these people develop completely wrong? And once they've completely wrong, now we can make their front teeth look straight by doing orthodontics. Well, that's crazy. We also know that the changes took place since the industrial age. We had pollution. We know the changes can be seen in utero. So they're not just developmental out of the baby, out of the body, but also in the body. So why would we wait to start to correct these problems till the brain is done developing? Why not grow these kids healthier mouth, mouth, mouths, healthier airways? Do you know have ever known anybody who's had a heart attack or a stroke? Yes. <clears throat> Okay, so we have an absolutely wonderful medication that they use for treating this, um, except it was kept off the market for years because a side effect of it seemed to be worth a whole lot of money to the drug companies. So what this drug does is it makes more nitric oxide and it opens up the coronary arteries so people don't die. Ah, but it also opened up coronary arteries in people's penises, and that made it Viagra, Sidenafil. And it made it so expensive that people who could use it for their heart couldn't get it because there was so much more money to be made using it as a drug for erectile dysfunction. So we can make our own nitric oxide. Do you know how to make nitric oxide and keep yourself healthy? Um, put electrical tape over your mouth. Just breathe through your nose. You got it. You breathe through your nose, you got more. And if you like beets, eat lots of beets. Beets. Because the guy who got the Nobel Prize for his work on nitric oxide actually has a company. Um, I got a link to it on my website because I've been taking the stuff for 10 years. Um, some of the products in beets are, are the raw materials for turning the beets into nitric oxide when you breathe through your nose. Well, I, I uh, <clears throat> first learned about this when uh, the Arizona Cardinals moved to uh, from St. Louis to Phoenix, and they just happened to, um, their headquarters was right down the street from my office, and a ton of them um, bought homes in Ahwatukee, and I was running into a lot, and they would get the, um, the what, what, electrical tape is the silver? I and, tell people, that's duct tape, I think. I tell people to use it, paper tape. Well, they, they would they would put out there, and they would uh, they would all say the same thing. They would say, uh, you know, you uh, if you just breathe through your nose, you only need to breathe half as much, blah blah. And then the other thing they would do 
is they would get oxygen tents so they could be sleeping at, you know, Phoenix, like a thousand feet above sea level, but it'd make them higher. And sometimes they like to go to, up to Flagstaff, but they'd always point out that everybody who wins the marathons, they're always, um, oh, um, what's that? Ken- Kenyans, because hey. Kenya is like the plateau. It's about, it's like a mile off the ground. And humans always lived where the big river dumped into the ocean, which is at sea level. So when they live and breathe and, do training at 6,000 and come down to sea level, they went. Just like when I went to um, um, the uh, um, Mount Everest, I didn't climb the thing, but I, uh, I I was thinking about it, but I decided to rent an airplane to fly me over. That was much more fun. Uh, but um, it was amazing, the Sherpas that you talked to when I was there, it was no big deal. They don't have auction things. I mean, they were when you're born as Sherpa, which is their their last name. When you're born at fourteen thousand feet, you don't you don't impress anybody by running to the top of that hill with a bunch of rich uh, Germans. So, um, anyway, but continue on. Sorry, didn't. No, you just gave a perfect lecture on epigenetics, genetics, genome, and phenome, because the guys who lived up high forever, over thousands of years, they've had genetic changes, and it's in their DNA. But when you didn't have the advantage of living like that forever, you can do your mouth taping or you can train up high in the mountains and you change the epigenetics. So the genes on our DNA are few and far between. And in between the genes, we have lots of other information on the DNA. And that stuff can be influenced. And, but you can also get epigenetic inheritance. So when a, when, if, some, if a woman has a baby, that baby has exactly the same epigenetic changes that the mother does. And her kids will have it. And it can transfer through multiple generations because the mother's eggs were in her from the time she was an infant. When you're, when a woman is born, her eggs are already present in her uterus. And so the changes that take place in this DNA, this is what's called epigenetics. And it's crazy. And this is what Coraccini talks about. This is what they're talking about with shrinking jaws. This is the infective environment on us. And it doesn't just affect us. It affects the next generation and the next generation. So we can go to more standard dental work. Did you know that if a mother has periodontal disease, she's more likely to have a low birth term or premature baby? So women who have low birth weight or premature babies, 50, 60 years later, those babies are more likely to have heart attacks and die young of a heart attack. It's like the stuff that happens, these are epigenetic changes. But when you understand that you can have epigenetic inheritance, then it can affect the generation before and the generation after. So when we correct the young kids by growing them bigger airways, we're going to correct the next generation as well. This is Kevin Boyd, I love it. If you, you, if you haven't done one with him, you need to do one with him because he's one of the smartest people out there. The guy's brilliant. And if you talk to Kevin, he's worried about the future of the human race. He's right. We need to worry about the future of the human race. You ever look around in this country and see a lot of fat people? Uh, only when I look in the mirror. Oh, okay. So all the time we hear about stuff with The Greek diet, the French diet, the Italian diet, the Mediterranean diet. You've probably been to those places. They eat huge meals, lots of fat, tons of olive oil. Why are they fat and we aren't? Why are we fat and they aren't? Well, they get fat when we give them McDonald's and we give them Burger Kings. My great uncle was the first guy to isolate vitamin B6. Smart guy, Sam Lukowski. But during World War II, he was largely responsible, one of the people largely responsible for C and K rations. He was a biochemist, nutritionist, hard science. That's what he did. Except the last 20 years of his life as a professor emeritus at Berkeley, what his research was, was that you couldn't get the proper nutritional value out of your food without gustatory enjoy, enjoyment. His words, the savoring and enjoying of your food was an essential part of the nutritional process. Now we know we have taste buds that go all through our elementary tract. We didn't know it back then. We know it now. What do you know about antibiotics for kids? You ever see any kid get antibiotic for an ear infection? Oh, he's got an earache, give him an antibiotic. He's got a sinus infection, give him an antibiotic. 
one of our most important organ systems and least studied ones, and they're studying it now at the NIH. They did the genome project that took several years, but now they're doing the biome project. And the biome project basically says our gut, our gut bacteria is an essential organ of our entire body. There are 10,000 different species of bacteria in our gut. And a lot of the nutrition we get, we don't get from the food, we get from the metabolites of the back, gut bacteria. And then we say, oh, well, who cares if this kid has big tonsils and adenoids and can't breathe well? That's okay. If he gets an airache, we'll just give him an antibiotic or cut his tonsils out. Well, that's great, but every time you give him an antibiotic, you mess that gut biome out a little more. You also mess up the biome in the sinuses. If you have a kid who gets lots of mucus in his nose, what happens in the kids with allergies, they get more cells that make mucus. They get more goblet cells and less cells that make serous. And inside our sinuses, we have those little cilia that we learned about a long time ago that moved the junk out. Well, if you get too much mucus and not enough serous, everything that comes in gets stuck in the muck and the little cilia can't move it out. And then we start to get middle ear infections and throat infections. But all these parts are connected. You can't separate one from the other. When I describe it to a patient, talking about TMJ problems, which you can talk about it with nutrition problems too, I tell them, pretend that you're a beat up old jalopy. You got a bad engine, you got a bad transmission, a bad U-joint, you got two bent axles, four bad rims and four flat as can be tires. But your husband says, I love my old jalopy and I'm gonna fix her up. So he gives you a brand new engine and a brand new transmission and a brand new U-joint, two new axles that are perfectly straight, four fantastic rims, and four top-of-the-line Michelin tires and inflates the first degree and balances them perfectly, and damn, the pump breaks. So he just leaves the fourth one flat. And he says, it's okay, it's 99% fixed. I'm gonna take a trip to California. And before you go 100 miles, you got four flat tires, four bad rims, two bent axles, a bad U-joint, a bad engine, and a bad transmission. If instead you took the old Schwinn pump out of the back of the garage, wiped off the cobwebs, and pumped it up halfway, you'd be able to drive that trip 20 times. It wouldn't be a great smooth ride, but it would work. Things give it their weakest point. So if you have somebody with a deviate swallow, and every time they swallow, they swallow wrong. The tongue is the strongest muscle by weight in our body. It's pushing things out of whack. If you do orthodontics, it's going to relapse. That's what oral myofunctional therapy is. It says, let's use these normal tongue reflexes. Let's let normal function develop normal anatomy. We all learned really early in our careers in, in anatomy, form follows function. We know that. Form follows function, so if we get our mouth functioning right, it'll be shaped right. I go to the museum, you look at skulls from a couple thousand years ago, everybody has great big wide jaws and huge airways, no crowded teeth. When orthodontics started to do stuff a little over 100 years ago, that was 300 years into the epidemic of small jaws. So we establish norms, but those norms were based on pre-existing pathology except for the Steiner analysis, who didn't develop a norm. He just looked at his son and said, well, my son is perfect, so I'm gonna make that normal. But all these things are, are there. The, the normal is 400 years past. Are you, a friend, are you a fan of Kurt Vonnegut? Who's that? Kurt Vonnegut, the author? No? No. Okay, so he wrote a book about how man evolved back into something similar to a seal. Um, he writes interesting books. You'd probably like them. They're a little weird, but so nice. I don't mind them. We are changing the evolution of human beings. The problem is we're not evolving in a positive direction. There are people out there who are devoting their life to it. So Kevin Boyd, who's a pediatric dentist and does all this stuff, is also working on a PhD in anthropology at Penn. Doesn't that sound like fun? It does. It actually does, <laughs> does, does. So we can change things. So I'm going to talk about something. I'm going to pick my SPG blocks right now. We yeah. Have We're going to throw me off. No, no. I mean, do that. So, um, yeah, that's a very um, um, 
interesting thing. I um, posted that. You you have a book on it. Where did I post that? Um, yeah, the uh, sphenopalatine ganglion blocks. Uh, I posted you. You have a book on that. I had an article in Cranial on it. Um, that was an accident because I wrote a I wrote a paper as a mastership thesis for ICMO, and they said, "Well, we're not going to publish it now. We want you to get it published in Cranio first. Well, they put you over the coals to get your references and everything else. It was a horrible experience, but now I'm an editor at Cranio. But it, it's but it's I, but I want I want to go back and before we switch subjects completely, just because it's confusing to the kids. Okay, so when we're talking about specialties and everything. Um, you know, in 1900, there were no specialties. By 2000, MDs had 58, we had nine. Now it's just 2020, we're up to 12, and, and they're just exploding everywhere. But the equivalent specialty over with the MD side, it's a word I can't even say. Um, would you say that's the, um, the um, oh, what is it, the uh, otolaryngology? Otolaryngologist uh, ENT is easier. Or that same thing as head and neck surgery too, right? HNS, head and neck um, surgery? Head and neck surgery is a different group because those are surgeons who specialize in head and neck surgery. Okay, how do you say O to, how, how do you say the word? Otolaryngologist. It's basically yeah. oh, oh, ear, and, ear and larynx. And then there's, uh, so there's that, and, um, there's, and that's the same thing as ENT, right? It's the same thing as an ENT. Yeah, so they should just drop that O. What is otorhinolaryngologist? Otorhinolaryngologist? Uh, he, he added the nose to the picture. Huh. But anyway, so is that our equivalent, of your equivalent? When someone like you is talking about oral facial pain, TMJ, all that, do you consider these ENT guys your counterpart colleague on the MD side? So overall, I'm going to say we're both looking at improving your way. So when I first started treating people with sleep apnea, they used to do UP3s on them. A UP3 was a uvula palatal pharyngoplasty. They would cut away the tonsils, the tongue, the uvula to open up a bigger airway. I was never a big fan of that because when I was at Rush, they showed it had 80% morbidity and less than 50% of the people got 50% better and they still all needed CPAP. I was kind of there looking at oral appliances. CPAP, and you mentioned my website, IHateCPAP.com. Well, let me tell you, I got a lot of flack from some of the sleep doctors who I work with because it says I hate CPAP. Well, I don't hate CPAP. In fact, I happen to love CPAP because if I can't treat a patient with an oral appliance, you can give them CPAP. The reason I have a website called IHateCPAP.com is because I'd see all these people looking for oral appliances, and I'd just ask them the simple question, why are you here? And they all told me the same thing. I hate CPAP. CPAP works great. Continuous positive air pressure to maintain an open airway while you sleep. It's like holding one of those buildings up with air by blowing fans into it that you play golf in during the winter. So Colin Sullivan, the guy who invented it, wears an oral appliance to treat sleep apnea down in Australia. So prior to CPAP, though, if you had sleep apnea, they had a really easy fix that was 100% effective for obstructive sleep apnea. Lift your chin up a little, Howard, put your finger right there. Yeah, they'd put a trachea right there. You'd breathe through your neck and you didn't worry about the size of your nose, your mouth, your tongue. Nothing blocked it because you just went below it. Now you had to cover it up if you wanted to talk when you were awake, but it worked great. So CPAP wasn't an alternative to correcting things. CPAP was an alternative to a tracheotomy. When we talk about everything we've done since then, we're moving in the right direction. So I did, I did sleep appliances since 1982, 83, um, and they all did the same thing. They held the jaw downward and forward to open up the airway so people could breathe. They pulled the tongue out of the posterior throat, and they didn't only make the airway bigger front to back, but they actually had a bigger increase side to side in the airway. It was great. People would wear it. 60% of the people given CPAP give it up completely. 15% struggle and only 25% use it on a regular basis. That's the gold standard. Good gold standard? How would, how would a gold standard that only works for one in four people stand up in dentistry? 
Um, I think they would uh, pull us off the gold standard. They'd pull you off the gold standard. So that's where dental sleep medicine came from. Now they're putting a pacemaker for the tongue to keep your airway open, the Inspire device, except they're going to stick this thing on one side of your tongue only, and it's only going to stimulate the muscles on one side. Do you remember that Harvold and the experiments he did on rhesus monkeys? Um, not off the top of my head. Okay, so Enid Harvold, he, he looked at airway. And he said, what happens if we block somebody's nose or we block somebody's and give them artificial tonsils in the back of their throat? Well, you know those kids with adenoid faces I talked about? Yeah. Well, the movies he blocked the airways, they looked more like those kids than those kids look like normal healthy kids. And they had smaller lungs and shorter legs and tongue thrusts and open bites and underdeveloped maxillas, all because of an airway blockage. But how soon is soon enough to fix this? He could do it experimentally, and then he could undo the experiment and it would reverse. Way back, I think it was Norland, way back over 100 years ago, said every child going through orthodontics should have a rhinologist involved, somebody to see that he can breathe right. This is not new. All the, There was a huge controversy. Should you take out tonsils and adenoids on kid, developing kids? Well, only if you want them to have a good brain. About 10 years ago, though, at Academy of Dental Sleep Medicine in Baltimore, this doctor from Sweden came in, and she was saying, yes, you need to take out the tonsils and adenoids, but if you do rapid maxillary expansion on the kids before you take out the tonsils and adenoids, a lot of times the tonsils and adenoids will shrink by themselves because the kids can breathe through their nose, they get less infections, the swelling goes away, they get more nitric oxide breathing through their nose, Nitric oxide is the strongest anti-inflammatory in the body. It takes a cup. It, you can do rapid maxillary expansion on a three-year-old almost overnight. The sutures haven't locked in together yet. They're just like this, and they go. So if you do rapid maxillary expansion, and then you can make the need for tonsil adenoidectomies go away, that's better yet. Well, unless you're an ENT who makes his living taking out tonsils and adenoids. So then you want to take them out sooner. But even the subject of tonsil and adenoids, it's like a giant pendulum that swings up and back. So 100 years ago, they took out, they did TNAs on everybody. And we're not talking about tits and ass, we're talking about tonsils and adenoids. One kid in the family got it, pull everybody else on the kitchen table and do them all. Then that whole pendulum swung the other way and they didn't want to take them out on anybody because they were worried we're going to mess up their immune system. And truth is, pendulums tend to swing too far one way or the other. Kind of like politics. When you're at any of the extremes, we're in trouble, but when you're more in the middle, we're always better off. That pendulum swing, it always swings too far. So let's talk about, I'm going to talk about my sphenopalatine ganglions now. So way back in 1908, Greenfield Sluter discussed Sluter's neuralgia, which we now think was maybe cluster headaches. Maybe it was the original diagnosis of TMJ headaches because we hadn't come up with the idea of TMJ yet. That came later. And he found that by sticking a cotton pellet soaked in 20% cocaine into the nose, these pains would go away. Well, that was pretty good. Later on, he wrote a book. And then he wrote a second book, Nasal Neurology, all about the neurology of the nose. And why did he call it neurology? Because he wanted the optometrists, ophthalmologists, and the neurologist to pay attention to it. It didn't work as well as he wanted. He described in detail what these did. In 1929, in the Annals of Internal Medicine, a guy named Hiram Beard published a paper on sphenopalatine ganglion phenomena. 10,000 patients, 2,000 patients, 10,000 blocks, no negative side effects. They were taking away headaches, migraines, nausea, anxiety, depression, low back pain, shingles, you name it, they took it. It worked. They published it. This stuff was gangbusters. And then it almost completely disappeared. What happened? Ah, drug companies came along. And now instead of having to do something, the doctor could write a script. And the sphenopalatine ganglion block started to slip in something known as forgotten medicine. There's a lot of things we learn and then we forget. And when forgotten medicine happens, the patient suffers. But it's way easier to write a script. I never would have heard about these things, except in 1986, a book came out called Miracles on Park Avenue. 
And it was all about this octogenarian otolaryngologist named Milton Rader in New York City. And this guy had one trick in his entire bag of tricks. He did one thing. He did sphenopalatine blocks on everybody. He had famous people, politicians, millionaires coming from all around the world to his little office in New York City. And he'd stick these little wires with patent pledges soaked in cocaine in people's noses. And all these things got went away. And that's kind of what saved it. Um, interesting, if you go on my video site, one of my videos is a doctor. He's a physician. And when he was a young kid, he was 10, 11, 12 years old. He had this worse headache from hell. I think he called it a sinus headache. He was in agony. And he goes into the doctor and he says, it's the old fashioned doctor. So he's smoking a cigar while he's examining him. And the guy looks at him for a minute or two. And then he takes this cotton pledge it and shoves it up one side of his nose and he shoves it up the other side of his nose. And like two minutes later, all the pain's gone. And this little kid goes outside. He jumps for joy. So he's so happy. And eventually he becomes a physician. Except he couldn't do that because when he became a physician, nobody ever taught him what it was. He eventually gave up being a physician and became an artist. He makes trees out of wire. Really nice work. That's how I met him because I was buying one of his trees. And then a few years later, I saw him again and he told me the story. He never knew it was a sphenopalatine ganglion block until he told me the story. I knew immediately. In fact, I didn't even get to tell him. My wife shouts out Anna next to him, he did a sphenopalatine block on you. It's like life changing. Today, I had a patient who's been in horrible anxiety for months, but the last three weeks have just been more than she can tolerate. She's having panic attacks that makes her feel like she wants to die right now, five times a day. We, we taught her how to administer with cotton tip catheters through her nose, sphenopalatine blocks on herself. The pain went the pain, and I'm talking about pain, but it's anxiety. Anxiety is horrible pain. It went away instantly. But I mean, you, you give her cocaine to take home? Nope, I give her 2% lidocaine. Oh, okay. You wouldn't be happy using 2% lidocaine with no vasoconstrictor in your office. And it takes less than, it's less than the equivalent of one carpel of 2% lidocaine with no vasoconstrictor that she puts in her nose. Well, this is uh, this is crazy that uh, I'm going to say this, but I actually, when I, I was in school in 1987, there was actually one patient in there that they dispense spray cocaine because she was having a oral cancer and throat cancer and all that, and she had to numb up to eat. But she had 99.99% aerosol cocaine that she just sprayed in the back of her throat, and I thought that was wild. So when I first started to do the blacks, 1986... I heard how Dr. Rader did it. So that's how I was going to do it. I used a little cotton pledget with cocaine. You can order cocaine with your drug license. It's a class two narcotic. The problem was after a month or two later, the DEA came in and they wanted to know where my used swabs were. And I figured, you know, I don't really want to talk that much to the government. And I switched to lidocaine. And you know, it worked just as well as the cocaine for me. Sometimes it took a little bit longer. Yeah. Now, you can also do an injection. You know Barry Glassman? Barry Glassman, oh my God. Okay, so Barry and wow. I don't agree about much. Oh, but really? He, but he used to be a neuromuscular dentist, and he used to be a member of ICMO, and he still listed on his biography. He's an oral facial pain guy now. But I've been do, I used to do sphenopalatine blocks through the greater palatine foramen on the roof of the mouth, or sometimes I'd go through the masseter muscle and do it. But Barry taught me how to do a suprazygomatic sphenopalatine ganglion block. And it's really easy. And it's like, it works better than any of the drugs in the ER for acute migraine. So let me, let me, let me talk some, about something first on a personal level. So you and Barry, okay, you guys know each other forever. You're both legends in your own field. There's a lot of young kids watching. How, how do you get along with people you don't agree with? Like, um, so uh, how, how, how does... I love people I don't agree with, because if you have somebody you agree with everything, you're never going to learn anything from. People learn through disagreement. You wanted to know the problem with the AOP? They don't want people to learn that way. That's the way people learn for thousands of years. They want to say, this is what it is, and just you listen to us. That's why they don't teach kids in school anymore how to treat TMJ. They teach them virtually nothing, because they want them to refer to, this, to the experts. 
Uh, I'm, I'm a general dentist. I still do root canals. I have an endodontist in my office, so I only do one canal root canals now. But it's like, I love doing everything. I do crown and bridge. I'll do partials. I'll do dentures. I'll do implants. I did my first implants back in 1980. I was a, to put an implant in in 1980, I was a quack. Absolutely. And I want you kids to remember that because dentist, dentists eat their own. And the guys who pioneered all this stuff, I mean, I was out here in Arizona and there's a guy who was flying to Albuquerque from Phoenix and this, and he had like three implant practices. And the first time, you know, all these patients that were dental cripples, they had dentures they couldn't chew or eat. And he put in a sob and they would love it. And he, would, everybody was happy. First time a case fell and went to the damn board, they took his license away. He ended ended up just being a drunk in a trailer out in Apache Junction. And I just, oh my God, it's just. Yeah, how many thousands of lives were ruined because he wasn't there to help them? Oh, yeah. And, and, you know, you think dentists would be, I mean, eight years of college, they'd be above all that crap, but uh, they're humans too. They, they, uh, I mean, just because you disagree with someone, shut up. I mean, I mean, I always tell dentists, look, the first 110 billion humans that live that look like us, they don't even know their name and they're dead. So why are you freaking out that some dentist on the other side of the town or the country believes something different than you? I mean, you don't even know one thought of the first 100 billion people that lived. And now you're going to, you know, they just, um, God, what happened to mind your own business and shut the fuck up? Actually, the first time I saw something with an implant that I didn't know what it was, I went to the guy's office to see what the hell he was doing. Oh, man. In my area, I had a guy guy named Dick Beals who was a member of the Alabama Implant Study Club. He got in instead of Lenny Linkow way back when. He was doing subperiosteals and ramus frames. And I I, I didn't want to do those things. They were a little, yeah, they're pushing it for me. But I I did a lot of subs. I did them with oral surgeons because I really like my oral surgeons, buddy. They're very good at surgery, better than I am. So I would work with them and we'd do these things. And I was lucky because I wasn't in the first generation of subperiosteal delivering dentists. I was the second generation. So the first generation did stuff and then they figured out where it went wrong. So when they did the subperiosteals on the lingual side in the back of the mandible, the little struts of the of the framework would start to show through the gum and nobody knew what to do with it and then they got mechanical engineers in who started to do flexion analysis of the mandible and what they found is the mandible flexes like this up and back gets wider and narrower in the back and it's like i had a big argument on dental town because i told somebody that the medial pterygoids are the flexors of the mandible oh my god they attacked me because i said they flex the mandible. And they said, no, they don't. They close the mandible. It's the masseter pterygoid sling, and they close the masseter. I'm going to hold my jaw up for you. I got. I didn't know if I'd need a, something to show you, but just in case. So here's my friend, George. He used to be a patient. He was a failed sub. But the medial pterygoid muscle comes from the inside of the jaw to the medial pterygoid plates on both sides. That's the direction of the vector of force. When they both contract at the same time, you flex the jaw. Well, guess what? If you're a dentist, what happens if you put a 14 unit fixed bridge that doesn't let the jaw flex? The jaw is still gonna flex. What's gonna break first? Is the bone gonna break down as the implants or the teeth get pulled out? Is the porcelain gonna break? Are they gonna break the structure or the superstructure? Something's going to give because when you put an unstoppable force and you put an immovable object in the same spot, something breaks. So let let me uh, ask another question that people are asking us. Sleep apnea, snoring, TMD, occlusion. There are some people on the circuit saying that um, you cannot do any TMD without doing a sleep screening, that the TMD equals sleep. And to uh, make someone a night guard without doing a workup for sleep apnea would be malpractice. Uh, where, how do you weigh in on that? Okay, so it's way overblown. However, there is some studies that say if you put somebody in an upper flat plane bruxism appliance and they have sleep apnea, it may get worse. 
So that's a possibility because I've been doing sleep forever when Cranio changed the name of its journal from the Journal of Craniomandibular Practice to the Journal of Craniomandibular and Sleep Practice, Riley Lund, the editor, asked me to write the, the guest editorial. So I wrote the editorial. Um, TMJ has a TMJ, the great imposter, has a co-conspirator, sleep apnea. So sleep apnea and TMJ are part of the same underlying issue. It's a developmental issue. It's an environmental issue. It's important. Do you have to treat both? No. Do you have to be aware of both and know when to refer and when to get a test? Absolutely, positively. Can you grow people out of both? That's one of the, one of the videos I placed today was a patient. First, we treated her TMJ that destroyed her life. And then we use the DNA, RNA appliances to grow her a bigger airway and cure her sleep apnea. So she doesn't need to wear a CPAP or an oral appliance. Now, are any of these things perfect? No. Do they work every time? No. Is there a little bit of trial and error? Absolutely. And you have to know enough to be able to look at things and re-diagnose every time they come in. Remember what they taught you about diagnosis when you first got into dental school, the first course in the diagnostics, they gave you a four-letter acronym to keep you clean. Do you remember what it was? Four-letter acronym. What was it? Didn't start with an F. It was SOAP. So, oh, subjective, obsess. Yeah. Subjective, objective, assessment, and plan. That was how we're supposed to diagnose our patient. So now we live in a medical world with HMOs, PPOs, and doctors have no time to talk to patients. We've been to a doctor lately where he sits at the computer and keying, he doesn't even look at you anymore. Now we have difficult patients with pain processes and they go to doctors and the most important information is sometimes the subjective information, what the patient tells you. Old fashioned doctors used to sit and talk with their patients. Doctors on an HMO PPO can't afford to do it anymore. It's so, all turned to a game of volume, hasn't it? Not, the second thing was objective. Objective measurements. So we can take x-rays. We can do cone beams now, and we can do MRIs. Ah, we can also do EMGs. We can also do uh, mandibular scans to see how the jaw moves. We can see how fast it moves. We can see if it gets displaced by a tenth of a millimeter on closure. Because if it gets displaced by a tenth of a millimeter, we're irritating the periodontal ligament on the tooth it's displacing on. There's at least 29 different neuroreceptors in the periodontal ligaments. And they head right into the, into the mesencephalon of the, trigeminal, of the trigeminal nerve, which is our proprioceptive part of our, of our job. So it's like, it's crazy important. Did you, we're, we're, we're the trigeminal masters. We are the masters of the trigeminal nerve. The mandibular block, that's the mandibular division, the lower third of the trigeminal. The maxillary block, that's the maxillary division. It goes to the sinuses. It goes to the inside of the nose. It goes all the saliva ducts and things. And then we get the, the ophthalmic. The trigeminal nerve goes to the cornea of the eye. There's a paper that was published that they put a chemical and cause a burn on the cornea of the eye. It causes inflammation in the brain on the trigeminal nerve. So just an irritation to the cornea of the eye. When we irritate other parts of the nervous system, it does the same thing. We treat people with headaches and migraines and cluster headaches, trigeminal autonomic cephalgias. You know what controls the blood flow to the brain? Carotid arteries? Ah, the trigeminal nerve, our nerve, your nerve. We are the masters of the trigeminal nerve and it controls the blood flow to the anterior two thirds of the meninges of the brain. What we do is crazy important. And if we happen to have a margin that's not perfect, but the crown's gonna last for the rest of the person's life, that's good. But if we mess up the occlusion and the person's gonna have migraines for the rest of their life, that's a bigger mess up. You can always fix a leaky margin. You can't give somebody back their quality of life. And I get people who've been in constant nonstop pain for five years, 10 years, 20 years. They wanna cure. They all come in wanting a cure. And the first thing you got to tell them, there's no cure. Because the only way you can cure these people, they've been in constant pain for 20 years. The only real cure you could give them would be a do-over in the last 20 years of their life. You got to fix them and you have to do it yesterday. 
And if you're talking about airway, you got to grow bigger airways in kids so they can grow bigger, smarter brains. These things are crazy, crazy, crazy important. And I'd love to say it's all my ideas, but everything I'm talking about, I stole from somebody. That's so, science. I, I, um, did you want to say anything more about this? Uh, um, these uh, SPGs. Okay, so so they almost disappeared. A couple of companies came along. One called Sphenocath. Actually, the product they make is a Sphenocath, and another one makes a TX360. They're two little squirt guns. They're very fancy squirt guns that you can squirt lidocaine through the nose over the area of the, of the, of the uh, sphenopalatine ganglion on the medial wall of the turcopalatine fossa. All of a sudden, neurologists who could usually only write scripts now have something they can do, and they charge anywhere from $850 to $4,000 to squirt lidocaine in somebody's nose. So once upon a time, I used to get my sphenopalatine ganglion blocks covered by medical insurance, whether I did injection or through the nose. In the last several years, all the medical insurance companies following the lead of Blue Cross Blue Shield have decided that sphenopalatine ganglion blocks are experimental. They won't cover them for any purpose whatsoever. Do you know what a uh, blood patch is? You ever hear of that? No. So when women go in and they get um, epidural for having childbirth, yeah. sometimes it works great, uh, but sometimes they wake up from, with the worst headache in the world. And it's because they're leaking cerebrospinal fluid, they think. And I say they think because we're not always sure. So the cure for this would be another invasive procedure where they do a blood patch over the area where the injection had been done. Well, right now, if you go and look online and look at epidural blood patch versus sphenopalatine ganglion block, sphenopalatine ganglion block is as effective or more effective as an epidural blood patch, and there's no risk involved. There's no surgical procedure involved. And Blue Cross Blue Shield says, well, we're not going to cover that. It's experimental. Back in 1929, Hiram Beard, 10,000 blocks on 2,000 patients with no negative side effects. But think of how many drugs have been out there that get approved by the FDA and then get yanked later. How many people have been addicted to drugs because they've been giving them for so long for their pain? And what we're going to make them in a formulation where they're safe. And then somebody crushes the pill and snorts it. It's like, we, we go on the drug route. I love the drug companies. I work with lots of Abbott and Baxter people. It's amazing what the drug people can do. But drugs aren't the answer to anything. So I'm just getting a simple way. If I said, what do we do? We want, our, we want our patients to heal. How do people heal? You just remove the impediments to healing. If you, if you have a, a nail coming through the bottom of your shoe and you walk on it for two days and you get a big infected blister at the bottom of your foot and you change your posture because you're walking funny and your knees and your ankle and your back hurt and you go to an orthopedic guy and you go to a wound care specialist and you go to the world's best physical therapist and massage therapist. And a week later, they have you all put back together perfect. And now you put the pair of shoes with the rusty nail coming through the bottom of it back on and you're right back where you started. You have to look at cause and effect. If you don't look at cause and effect, if you don't look at how to make it better and how to prevent it, what's the point of being called a doctor? It's about health, not disease. So um, a lot of kids listening to you today, how do you recommend they learn this? I mean, when they come out of school, uh, they need help in, uh, in everything, implants, everything. So how do you, what advice would you give to the kids listening to you right now that are in dental school? They're in dental kindergarten school. How do they learn more about all this stuff? Okay, so I'm going to tell you what I did. So the American Academy of Implant Dentistry had just started when I went there. And I said, implants sound good. I'm going to do implants and I'm going to be a rich dentist. So they had a four course thing and I took course one, course two, course three, course four. Oh God, who's the guy in Detroit, the young guy, Carl Misch. Carl Misch says at the end of the fourth quarter, if any of you go out and do, do implants after taking these four courses, I'll testify against you in court because you don't know what you're doing yet. And he said, go find somebody who does this and go study with them. And I went to dentists who did implants and I spent time in their offices. I went to spend a lot of time with Dick Beals I went into the oral surgeon's office. Merv Rosen used to be there. I'd go and watch with him. And then when I was going to do subperiosteals, I said, yeah, you know, he can do the surgery and I can take the impression of the jaw. 
We didn't have CT scans to do that yet. So you had to take an impression of the exposed jaw. It's a lot. I started doing implants. I did pin implants. They're easy. We used to put three little bone pins in a bone and you turn them into a teepee and put a crown on top of it. They were orthopedic bone screws. They weren't dental implants. How did I learn that? I saw somebody else do it. I said, isn't it hard to clean? He says, yeah, but implants don't need to be as clean as teeth. He was right. They don't decay. And they didn't get gum disease. You really have to screw it up to get gum disease. And usually we like to blame the patient when we get gum disease. But it's usually we got cement on the implant that causes the bone loss. It's usually iatrogenic. So that's what you don't want to do. So what do you say to the young guy? You want to treat TMJ and pain? Go into people who are already doing it, see what they're doing, see their results. Try not to make the same mistakes. If you don't learn from somebody who's already been down that road, you're going to make mistakes. I'd been doing TMJ for a long time, and a doctor up in a retired orthodont, neuromuscular orthodontist in Milwaukee was retiring, Dr. Savanach, and he had had two or three of his friends die. And he was like in his 60s. And he said, you know, I'm gonna, I've always wanted to travel across the country in my uh, one of those silver trailers that people pull around, Airstream. I want to travel in my Airstream. He closed his office. He spent a year, once every other week for a year, he came and taught me not the TMJ that he did. He wanted me to know the history of the last 40 years of how he got to where he was. Because of the thought process in every step of the way that you make. And if you teach the technique, but you don't understand the thought process behind it, you're never going to be able to think yourself through problems. So Generation X, the problem is we don't have problem solvers. We need problem solvers. You need to look at things and say, what's the best way to do this? I see people all the time, they're perfectly willing to pull all of somebody's teeth out and put in all in four implants. I freak out when I see this stuff. I, the idea of people taking out perfectly healthy teeth to put in implants for no good reason other than making a lot of money bothers me. There are lots of people where all on four is a godsend and it's an absolutely wonderful procedure. But there's a lot of stuff that's not necessarily done for the right reason. And when we start to do that, we start to destroy the trigeminal nervous system and the input to the brain. And all these nerves that come in the brain make lots and lots of connections. And some of them turn things on and some of them turns things off. And it's like, I have a light switch. I can turn the light in this room on and off. Except in the brain, we have thousands of light switches. And different combination of those light switches cause different things to happen. And we have to look at all of them to see what the net result is. So we do an experiment on our patient. And we take off all their teeth and we give them an all on four. And then we say, ah, oh, how did that work? It's like, and sometimes it works good. Sometimes it didn't. I went in when I was young, right out of dental school. In fact, even before I was out of dental school, I went into doctor's offices who were doing vitreous carbon implants. They don't last. When I got out of school, I did a lot of Kyocera single, single crystal sapphire endodontic implants. So we take a short root and we drill a hole through the bottom of an endodontically treated tooth and we drop this single sapphire crystal made by Kyocera through the tooth and cement it in place. And I'll tell you what would invariably happen two or three years later. The tooth would rot away or crack. But the implants kept working. So we call them endodontic stabilizers, but we were actually doing the first ceramic implants. Now there's lots of people who are worried about metal in the bone. You heard about any of this? Yeah, are you worried about it? I like titanium implants, uh, but I have patients who are worried about it. And they now make zirconia implants. Well, we know zirconia is hard. It doesn't break easy. Except I didn't like the company and I didn't like the system. I love Strauman implants and I trust them. Now Strauman makes a zirconia implant and you can use the same instrumentation. I like that. It's like, am I doing them? No. But that one, of, but I had a patient, one of the patients in that video went to a biologic dentist because she, they pulled out a couple of teeth that had root canals. I don't do that, but they felt it was necessary. They took them out and then she left town and I didn't see her. 
And so in my mind, they took out her posterior teeth and I don't care how good she is. I don't know if it's good enough. She came back in, they put two ceramic implants in and they did an absolutely perfect bang up job on what they did. It's great. I listen to the biological dentist. Do I do all the stuff they do? No, but why wouldn't you listen to what they have to say? If they talk about root canals being infected, well, how infected is too infected? I don't know. I have an ozone machine. I don't use it in my dental practice, but I certainly wouldn't fault anybody who does. When I got my first laser, that was kind of quackery. Now everybody's got a laser. It's like things change. And the, the, the other thing I want to say is um, um, he just said something very profound um, that, um, you know, I mean, the, the, the patients asked for this. So if a patient believes metal, I mean, they asked me, you know, they said they want metal-free fillings. I always say, well, do you drive a metal-free car? Um, does Southwest Airlines have a metal-free plastic plane for people like you? I mean, why, why are you against metal? And, but anyway, the bottom line is people are just batshit crazy. I, I think one in four of the 8 billion humans, what, what percent of humans would you say are pretty, pretty illogical? Emotional. Before or after I've treated them, because I found that when I talk to patients, I have these crazy people sometimes come in. However, I always like to suspend my opinion until I have the benefit of time. My partner has will absolutely refuse to treat TMJ patients because he thinks they're crazy. No, they, 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 a lot of them. What percent of the, of the TMJ patients are crazy? I'm not going to call them crazy because I'll tell you what I talk about instead of crazy. But what I find is sometimes I don't meet the patient until they've been in three, four, five, six visits. Because when they're suffering constantly, right, not who they are. And all of a sudden, oh, look at this. I got this wonderful person here. So I spend a lot of time talking to patients. So they love everybody in oral facial pain loves the HPA. Hypothalamus, pituitary, adrenal, access, access to... That's great. So they think in a lot of ways that everybody's got a psychosomatic problem. Years ago, I was told by a pain practice doctor at Lake Forest Hospital, well, if you, what's the point of fixing their TMJ? If you make their head and jaw better, they're just going to have low back pain and stomach issues. Well, the whole body is connected and maybe he's right, but not for the reasons he thinks. So I talked to my patients about the difference between a psychosomatic issue and a somatopsychic issue. So in terms of pain, if you're treating a patient with pain, a psychosomatic issue is one that means I hurt because I'm crazy. And I ask my patient, are you crazy? And they go, no. And I say, good, because I don't think that's what you have. And then I ask them, have you ever had a doctor who treated you like you were crazy? And then they'll start telling you stories. They hate those doctors. Well, the then point, I, the point I, you know, I, well, let me finish this and oh, okay, then, I'll okay, okay, okay. Yeah. then I say, well, you know what a somatopsychic problem is? Same two words, just in a slightly different order. So if psychosomatic says, I hurt because I'm crazy, somatopsychic says, my pain is making me crazy. So, Howard, if you hurt all the time, really bad, would you be a little crazy? Oh, I, 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 I have a lot of pain every 10 years. I had that kidney stone thing. And me and my sister, Kayleen, we both have that. Like every How would 10 you years like to live drive. with that for 10 years? I know, I know. And you don't know, but you know what? It's possible that person with the TMJ pain that we think is nuts, that their pain might be worse than that kidney pain. Ah, yeah. you, Kidney pain, they say, is the worst, but same, they say the same thing with a hot pulpitis. The guy who comes in with his mouth packed in ice and he won't let you take the ice out long enough to get him numb because it hurts too much. And acute pulpitis is one of the worst pains known to man and it's put on the same level as a kidney stone. And where does that information get into the brain? Oh, it comes down our pathways, our trigeminal nerve. It's us. That's our part of the brain where most of the stuff with pain comes in. And it doesn't just go straight in. It goes, the stuff in the trigeminal nerve comes and it enters the limbic system. That's where we feel our emotions. So we can feel happy, excited, accelerated, all these great things. And we can feel sad, downcast, and miserable. And you know, pain, pain's a little bit under that sad, downcast, and miserable. But it's really hard to be excited and exhilarated and great when you're in terrible pain. You ever kick your toe on the foot of the bed in your bedroom? 
where you gave it a really good whack and like you're holding onto your toe and bouncing up and down in one foot? Yes. Are you a crazy person when that happens? Yes, and I learned <laughs> new words. Do you have any humanity? Yeah. That pain may be nothing compared to what some of our patients live with on a day-to-day basis. We have people with trigeminal neuralgia. I don't see very many of those. What I see instead are people with atypical trigeminal neuralgia. I'd like to call it idiopathic trigeminal neuralgia. And the reason I call it that is because when it comes to the doctors, we're usually idiots as to the pathology. So we throw a drug at it. We can give everybody Lyrica and Gabapentin, but what if you can just fix what's causing the problem? Take that rusty nail out of the shoe instead of trying to drown it in chemicals to make it go away. Oh, my gosh. I, I could talk to you for 40 days, 40 nights. Um, I love doing I, I love getting you on because um, I, I just know you and I could tell by with that post you were just in you were in pain when you wrote that post. You were so mad if that happened. And I wanted to, you to um, talk about that. And I also know that when the kids come out of school, I just listen to them. And, and um, this, you know, it's tough times. Um, when, when schools are doing good, they hardly got to do any fillings, crowns, and root canals. But they never get to place in TMJ or, you know, sleep or, you know, this. So um, what you kids got to do is it's, it's a lifelong learning process. You practice dentistry. You'll never master it. And the dentists who take 100 hours of CE a year, their whole journey, they run into so much exciting stuff. They always find stuff they're interested in that are fun, that their community needs, that are profitable, and they make money. And, um, I mean, um, Ira can't go to every small town in Kansas and you just delivered him two hours of solid information about um, one of the most controversial things of dentistry, occlusion, TMJ, TMD, bite, all that stuff. And um, it was just an honor um, to um, – I've read your 500 posts over the years since 2004. You're a legend to so many. And uh, you're in Chicago right now, right? I'm in Chicago now, but I have to say something about those small towns in Kansas City. After I learned about SPG blocks and did my little play with cocaine, I went to, I don't remember where it was in Kansas City, and Jack Hayden was there, and he taught me how to do it right. He's a dentist. Remember yeah. him? He old, old fashioned, older than me. Yeah, and now with the, the price of, you know, when I started flying in 1990 to lecture, I mean, it was like Eastern Airlines, every seat's a grand, the planes were half empty, everybody that got on the plane was dressed. I can remember getting set home on America West because I had tennis shoes on, and I was running late, and they they wouldn't even seat you at tennis court. But as the price came down, then it turned into a school bus, now you can get on Southwest Airlines half naked uh, with flip-flops and, you know, all that kind of stuff like that. But what I'm saying is now people that don't have trust in their local dentist because he doesn't, he called him a quack or he doesn't believe him, they're getting on planes and flying. And um, I cannot believe um, if you don't have your work on your website, the implant doctors who have their work on their website routinely are having patients fly Southwest Airlines to go have their work done because they don't think their their dentist back home can do it. And um, but um, so those blocks when you 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 putting up those videos, that's massive search engine optimization. I mean, hell, you got ten websites. You're always putting up YouTube videos, and if you're looking at SEO, let me let me explain it like this. If I sent you a text, hey homie, I mean that's just a few zeros and ones. If I took a selfie of Ira and texted it to you, now we got a still image, that zeros and ones is a block long. But if this hour-long video that we just did on SEO, that would go to the moon. And when you look at Google's um, search algorithms, number one, nobody knows it outside of Google. I mean, you would, and so the guy at the Holiday Inn at the dental convention doesn't know anything. And if he does know so much, why didn't he work over Microsoft? They'd give anything to be Google. But they will tell you, that um, two-thirds of those uh, algorithms uh, for SEO are video. So I go on your website, and you got a um, you got a um, AOL.com email address. Okay, why don't you – that just says erectile dysfunction all over it. Maybe I should get a younger doctor. Why don't you get a Gmail one since it's owned by the Google boys? And then uh, Alphabet owns uh, YouTube. That's where the SEO is. Ira's – you said you're 70 years old? 70. I'm 70 years old. old, and he's put up two YouTube videos a day, and you're a millennial on Snapchat, and you don't have a video on your uh, website. So get the videos, get the um, 
the Gmail account, get the content, and find something you like. I mean, when you ask me, should I specialize? I mean, I don't want to be a pediatric dentist specialist, and I, I don't want to do what you're doing. I really don't. Um, and I don't want to be a cosmetic dentist. I don't want to tell some 50-year-old lady that she's going to be beautiful if I file all her teeth down and veneers and all that stuff. I, I'd, I'd rather tell them, hey, you're great. Your ex is an asshole. Uh, just, uh, you know, whatever. But... You find something you love. We've got 12 specialties in dentistry. we got a bunch of patients. You don't have to go to specialty school. Remember, we just challenged that in a, that was challenged in Texas where they tried to tell an implantologist that he couldn't say he was a specialist in implantologist. And the judge's like, why? And they said, well, the American Dental Association doesn't recognize it. And they're like, well, who cares? They're a membership club. They're not a regulatory agency. They're they're not the government. And and if um and I have seen people during the pandemic that were gonna go back to endo school and now everything's a shit show. And I told them just don't do it. Just go back to your eight dentists in that town and say you're just gonna be practice limited and for one tenth the money you could take every Root canal continued. Hell, you could go live with Cliff Ruddle for that amount of money uh, for a year and his wife, Phyllis, cook you breakfast. Um, so just uh, keep you know listening, 100 hours a year. That's why I do these podcasts, turning you on to people like Ira, free of charge while you're driving down the road. Find Great. something that's fun and interests you and, and stay with it and dentistry will be good. So I'm going to tell them some book they should read. Okay. You need to read the book, The Outlier. Malcolm Gold, Malcolm Glidewell. Well, yeah, ten thousand hours makes you an expert. That's what happened to Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak and all the rest of these things. He has another book called Blink. Right. I think it was one of his first books. People have made their decisions in less than a second. You know what? And, and and that book has to be true. It's true. Read those books. I, yeah. I worked. I worked with Bill Blatchford forever it's a lot of money to go work with bill blatchford yeah you to think like a businessman but you know and i'm gonna gonna review that blink real quick because it's very profound in the fact that you know when you know you've evolved i mean for i mean your life's been going on since the beginning if if any broke break in the chain we'd be extinct but when you're walking down a path and all of a sudden a saber-toothed tiger jumps out you don't have time to sit there saying huh I wonder if that's an omnivore or a herbivore or a carnivore. Well, he does have um, sharp canine teeth. You'd be dead. So your brain and your ophthalmic and audio, you rip through all that instantly and you skedaddle, fight or flight right up a tree. And your whole life, you don't, since you're not out there getting eaten, you don't, you, you don't have any brothers and sisters that you watch eaten by hyenas. You start not listening to your intuition, man. And you, uh, you saw it in college where they, they always say, damn, I went with B and then I erased it and changed it to C. It's like, dude, your whole evolution in one second that it was A, but you thought about it for five minutes and you thought back until you were a Neanderthal and you erased it and do it. So when you're with a patient, you're treating it and you feel stressful, okay, that the patient's stressed. You know, you know, the young kids where the patient has to raise her hand before you're aware of it, you should feel it. When you're, when you're doing a procedure and you think, oh, man, that just really wipes me out. Well, I think you're probably sitting next to someone who was wiped out. Um, listen to your intuition. Um, when you ask someone, do you think it'd be okay if I do? Well, well, you just asked, right? Well, what the hell's making you ask? Your intuition. So you already answered yourself. If you have to ask, you've already answered yourself. But listen to this intuition, and um, you're right. Patients aren't always right, but they, they always got to be respected. And uh, when they come to you, they don't need a priest. They don't need a politician. They don't need a police officer. They need a doctor. And, <clears throat> and listen to them. And uh, Ira, you're a legend, and uh, thank you so much for coming on the show. And if you ever want to do it again, come back. I'll come back. Thanks for the opportunity. It was it's fun to do. It's a problem when you love to hear yourself talk. <laughs> Well, I mean, you own that town of Chicago. I I think it's important that people understand what they're doing. And if if you're all the young dentists you talk about, I'll give them one piece of advice. Find things you love to do and do more of them. Because if you love doing what you do every day, you go to work and you get to play. If you go into work every day and you're not liking what you're doing, it's work. And the yeah. difference is attitude. And if you want to have a, the difference between work and play is attitude, and you want to have a good attitude, do things you love. 
Yeah. I mean, when you do things you don't like to do for money, it's going to lead to dysfunction, depression, disease, right. and, and uh, just, um, just you know. It, it's, a, it's a problem. If, yeah. if we all just, do you know the word mensch? No. Okay. It's a, so it's, it's a Hebrew it's a, word, right? It's a what? Hebrew word? It's a Yiddish word. Yiddish, which is so Russian. In the, in the easiest explanation of mensch is every time in our life when we come upon a decision, we have to think about what to do. We always know what the right thing is to do and what the wrong thing is to do. But sometimes the right thing is the thing that's good for us. It's an easy decision. Sometimes the right, the wrong thing to do is what's good for us and the right thing to do is what's bad for us. We always know what we should do. So a mensch is when you make the decision that you should make, even if it's not necessarily what's best for you at that moment. But we all know that. We, we know. Hey, you're, you're Catholic, so you guys measure sins. I'm Jewish, and we, guy, we, me, we measure mitzvahs. So we count the good deeds. But we get lucky because once a year, we get forgiven for everything, and we get a fresh, clean slate of slate year after year. But it's like, do the right thing. If you do the right thing by not doing the wrong thing, or you do the right thing by choosing to do the right thing, you're doing the right thing. And every one of those young guys out there, don't do the wrong thing because you're not going to sleep well at night. Don't do things that don't let you sleep. All right, my man. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. 